Today's video comes from an interview I conducted in early 2017 with Father Michael Alexa when he came to the area to give some lectures. Father Michael is a talented storyteller. He has served as a village priest, as a university professor, and has written a number of books on Alaskan culture and history. So I hope you'll enjoy this episode uh, from my interview with Father Michael. about this since I'm living in Alaska in villages that have been Orthodox for hundreds of years, but we still have people coming to the church, um, many through, through reading, through research. Entire groups have converted to Orthodoxy simply, as they put it, looking for the ancient or the undivided church of the first millennia and millennium, and then realize it's orthodoxy. Where, where, do we, where do we attach ourselves to an orthodox church? And they read Bishop Callistos Ware's The Orthodox Church and The Orthodox Way, and uh, Father John Meyendorf's The Orthodox Church, and they have received a good introduction to the history and theology of orthodoxy. And then they, be, they look around and try to attach themselves to a particular parish, a particular jurisdiction, and they find orthodoxy in America rather, well, complicated. Half, maybe most, of the churches in, uh, in the 48 contiguous states uh, were founded by immigrants. So they have ethnic names attached, the Greek Orthodox parish, the Romanian Orthodox parish, the Albanian Orthodox parish, the Bulgarian, the Ukrainian, the Russian, and so forth. And you go there and you find that maybe some of the worship is still being conducted in that ancestral or archaic language. And it, it, you don't feel at home there because you're not a member of that ethnic group. And then you go to another one, and while they may be a bunch, mostly converts, um, they're discussing or divided among themselves about what jurisdiction they should be in, uh, what calendar they should be using. Um, in other words, the problem is that there's no perfect parish. Uh, there's no perfect match. Um, and so you could be discouraged and say, well, you know, let's try the Episcopalians. Well, let's, let's go to the Roman Catholics. Let's keep shopping because the Orthodox seem to be dysfunctional in some way. Or at least they don't, they don't meet the ideal that you read about in the book. I would point out to such people who may be discouraged or frustrated, uh, first of all, there's no one right way. The rubrics vary from country to country, and they've varied from century to century. If anyone says, well, we do it the right way and all the others are wrong, stay away from that. That would be my advice. Because they're not telling the truth. They may sincerely believe that, but it simply isn't true. Rubrics and practices and liturgical rites have changed from century to century over the years. There's not one right way. In my opinion, the right way is the way that meets the spiritual needs of the people who attend that church. Now, if those people speak mostly Romanian, then to meet the spiritual needs of those people is going to be to use the Romanian language. If they mostly speak English, then obviously the use of English is going to be necessary. But we have to be able to accommodate that. It's not a strike against the church that it's meeting the spiritual needs of the people who founded that church and who attend that parish. We have to allow for that. And that's what gives us this tremendous variety but it's not as if one way is right and the other one is wrong. In my opinion, it's only wrong if it's not meeting the spiritual needs of the people who are there. That would be wrong. But, um, but as long as they're doing what those, the people who have founded or have built that church uh, have done, the way they've imported it from wherever they came from, that's okay, that's legitimate. But maybe most of the people in that parish, it's certainly true here in the Diocese of the South, maybe very few or none of them have been cradle orthodox, as they're called. And the, it's up to that parish then to sort of find its own way. What musical tradition will they use? The freedom we have in North America is they're all ours. There's no such thing as the right music. If you like Romanian litanies and Byzantine chant on Holy Friday for the Lamentations and Russian, the Russian canon for the Paschal Vigil, we're free to pick and choose whatever we like as long as it meets the pastoral needs of the people in that parish. So you can discuss that, it's open, but we have 
2,000 years of history and hundreds of different varieties in iconography, in art, in architecture, and in uh, rubrical or liturgical practices. And we're free then to, we should be free, and not to say, well, you know, the way they did it in Russia in 1880 is the ideal, and all we have to do is replicate that. That's archaeology. That's not worship or theology, and it could be damaging to people who believe, well, if that's right, then you mean the way I've done it, and my, pa my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents did it, that was somehow wrong, that we were, we've been doing it wrong all this time, and now all of a sudden you're coming and telling us the one right way. I would say don't fall into that trap. The church is, a, is like a lens, and we join the church to put ourselves under that lens so that God that the, the teachings and theology, that Christ himself can be focused on us. The church's liturgical and sacramental life is that lens by which that Spirit of God, which is everywhere present and fills all things, can somehow be concentrated on us, and we deliberately put ourselves under that lens in order for the whole theology, teaching, doctrine, and spirituality of the church can somehow gain a focus, and we can place ourselves under that in order to receive the presence of God in a more intense way. I think we experience this most ex express expressively and intensely during Holy Week and Pascha. And in that respect, as long as you're at a church where you can understand what's being sung, that's good, that's good, that's, that's what you need. Uh, the personalities involved are hardly relevant. Uh, the church is the church, that lens is the lens no matter where you go in the whole world. Now, if it's in a language you don't understand, obviously it's not going to be able to concentrate the same uh, texts and meaning as intensely. It really helps to, you know, you really have to be in a church where you can understand what's going on. But if you're a Greek Orthodox and you speak Greek and you can go to church and you understand and you've learned from childhood the meaning of all these hymns and it's just the way you've worshipped all your life, God bless you. There's no reason for you. Now, if you're not, and you don't understand it, well, maybe that's not the best situation for you, but it may be the best, the only one available within, in our context, hundreds of miles. So you make the best, you let it go, and you don't complain about the, the practices of this particular parish because it's not meeting your needs. I think that's a rather individualistic and perhaps Protestant mentality. The church isn't here to meet your needs. You're here to meet the church's needs. It's not what you get from it that counts, it's what you put into it. And if that means that you have to learn the Greek alphabet in order to follow the texts in the Greek and the English translation on the facing page, that may be an extra effort you're called, but don't become discouraged. You, you sort of get what God gives you and accept that. And then as you look more closely, especially those who have converted to the Orthodox faith by virtue of reading the history and the doctrine and the texts, Oh, this is not the Colostos. This is not the Colostos where church I read about. It's not, the church is never that perfect ideal. Nothing with human beings included is perfect. The closer you look at anything a human being is doing, the more you find the flaws, the faults, and the mistakes. The most beautiful painting or tapestry. The closer you look, <laughs> the more you discover where the weaver or the painter messed up in some way, and then they kind of did their best to fix that. My daughter, who's an actress, says there's no such thing as a perfect performance. You can do the same uh, Shakespearean production night after night and make a different mistake every night, but you never get it 100%. And the same for celebrating the liturgy. People get upset because the choir messed up on that pitch and started and have to, had to redo, or the clergy sp uh, stumbled over some of the prayers. It's a human production. There's no such thing as a perfect performance. Don't get upset about that. Go with the flow. Allow human beings to be human beings. Uh, you do the best you can. It's an offering to God. So you make it as beautiful as you can, but it, it's never going to be perfect. And then when you look at even the ethical and moral conduct of Christians, that can be rather disappointing at times. You find out that there's been even crimes committed within the church. The parish funds have been misappropriated or mismanaged. It could be the diocese. It could be at the higher level. It doesn't matter. We have to remember this. There was a time when the church had 12 members. And Jesus Christ himself was the pastor and rector of those 12. It wasn't perfect even then. 
Judas was dipping into the till. Peter was denying. Thomas was doubting. James and John were, were uh, uh, trying to lobby for higher places, the, the thrones on the right and left hand in the kingdom of God. There was ambition. There was pettiness. There was misunderstanding. There was ignorance. There was dishonesty. There was theft. There was denial and betrayal. And that's when the church had 12 members. So if you're in a parish, that isn't quite perfect. Remember that when Jesus Christ himself was the leader, the pastor, the rector of the group, and there were only 12 disciples whom we now call the holy apostles, it wasn't perfect then. Why? Because we are fallen, sinful human beings. The church is holy by virtue of Christ's holiness. The church is holy by virtue of God's holiness. It's not holy by virtue of ours. And when God decides to impart his holiness through whatever medium, the laying on of hands of a pastor on the, on the head of a sick person, or the touching of an icon or a cross uh, by, on the same person, God can use whatever he wants. He wants to make it obvious that it's really him and not us. And I think that's why uh, Jesus Christ didn't choose the best and brightest of the Jewish religious leadership to be his disciples. He picked barely literate fishermen who had very little theological training <laughs> because he wanted to show that their wisdom on Pentecost was not their wisdom at all. It was from God. And God uses the lowly very often to reveal his wisdom. He doesn't choose the best and the brightest among us to be his servants. He chooses those who were clearly incapable of concocting <laughs> or faking or manipulating other people. He uses those who are humble for his glory. And finally, I would say, there's nothing God would like better, I, I think, than to make all of us into miracle workers and prophetic visionaries. And he doesn't, or at least he hesitates, because he knows if we suddenly all did become uh, eloquent preachers of the gospel and miracle workers, it would destroy us. We would become so proud and arrogant that our own spiritual lives, our own souls, would be distorted in a very harmful way. And so it's our own lack of humility that makes it, that precludes God using us the way he would like. Hi again, hope you enjoyed this episode from my interview with Father Michael Alexa. Please subscribe to get notified when new videos become available, which happens every Friday. And if you would, please leave a comment below letting me know what you thought of this video. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week.